I'm Jenna Ellis. Join me coming up on Jenna Ellis tonight as we talk first about the situation in the Middle East with our power panel. We'll break down what the IDF has done over the weekend and what the geopolitical response will be. We're also going to take a look at Veep Stakes with Kamala Harris uh, saying that she's going to select her vice presidential uh, nominee and running mate before next Tuesday ahead of that Pennsylvania rally. What does that mean and will that individual square off with vice presidential nominee on the GOP side, J.D. Vance. And how can the GOP step up their messaging? We have all of the white dudes for Kamala and uh, this kind of apologetic uh, sort of framework that the Democrats are assuming that they're getting votes based on identity politics. Can the GOP be better in their messaging to actually get those critical votes? We'll talk about all this and more coming up next. Well, friends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza extravaganza. Two-pack multi-use MyPillows are just $25. MyPillow sandals, also awesome, only $25. Their six-pack towel sets are $25. And brand new four-pack dish towels, you guessed it, just $25. For the first time ever, the premium MyPillows with the all-new Giza fabric, just $25. And orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to MyPillow.com, use the promo code Jenna, or call 800 564 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475 or go to mypello.com and use the promo code Jenna. Good evening and welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So we're going to start over in Israel with a very bold move by the IDF that is escalating tensions in the Middle East. And this headline coming from CBS killings of Hamas leader in Iran and Hezbollah commander in Beirut fuels fear that the Israel Gaza war will spread. So let's bring in our power panel to discuss. Uh, we have Ron Coleman, who is an attorney and the host of the Coleman Nation podcast. Uh, we have Matt Tierman, who's the head of V24 Investigations, and Oren McIntyre, who is a writer at The Blaze. So uh, Matt, let's start with you. Um, this is a pretty aggressive move by Israel and it's coming uh, just a week after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed Congress here in the United States. Um, Anthony Blinken uh, was, was suggesting last week that there wouldn't be uh, this type of aggressive move. So uh, does this perhaps uh, widen as some outlets are suggesting uh, the, the uh, Middle East conflict? Well, thankfully, uh, the Israelis do not go to uh, the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken for a you know affirmative or negative on what they should do next in defending their sovereignty and defending their own uh, their own population. You know, the catalyst here on escalation was Hezbollah and that bombing that killed you know a dozen kids uh, in in northern Israel a couple of days ago. You know, escalation. It's been escalating since October seventh, and this was not catalyzed by Israeli action. It was catalyzed by Islamo fascist terrorism actions and proxies of Iran in Hezbollah with Hamas in Gaza, uh, with, you know, the Palestinian uh, Authority doing nothing, you know, talking out of both sides of their mouth and saying, yeah, well, we're uh, we're not partaking in this, but also still, you know, pay to slay and allocating funds to those who mass murder or suicide bomb. So Israel's doing, as I've said on the show with you many times, Israel's doing what it's going to do as it should to protect its sovereignty, its people, uh, life in general, uh, and from the, the horde of Islam fascists in that region and thank God for them we all pray for their success because Western civilizational values hang in that balance yeah, and that's a great uh, jumping off point for Oren McIntyre to enter the conversation, you know, in terms of Western civilization. And we've seen, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, global politics that have really 
uh, not been advocates for um, Israel defending its sovereignty or really any nation defending its own sovereignty. And so, you know, where do you see um, some of the fault lines here in terms of the media's response being so anti-Israel um, and really trying to paint this as Israel being the aggressor, which is just factually incorrect? Well, obviously, the left and particularly the media have shifted into this frame of colonization for a long time. Israel seemed to have a bit of the unprincipled exception when it came to its ability to avoid this left wing bromide. But now it has been applied and Israel has been brought into the family of Western nations that are evil and horrible because they are the colonizers. They are the oppressors. Ultimately, as Matthew pointed out, Israel is a sovereign nation, so I'm more than fine with them doing what they need to do to protect themselves as they see fit. But just as they do not ask the United States or Joe Biden what they're going to do before they do it to protect their nation, I would simply ask that we, as the United States, not be asked to be pulled into any conflict that is created by their actions. The United States might say, yes, you as a, a nation that perhaps shares some of our values, has the right to defend yourself. We we, you know, we lend you that. You know, we support that. But we do not want to be directly involved. We do not want to be involved in giving you funding. We don't want to be involved in any conflict that might be created by this. And I think that's the message that needs to be consistently brought forward to a country that is making its own choices geopolitically. Ron Coleman, do you agree with that? I mean, there are some U.S. interests here um, in terms of, you know, Americans that were, uh, were captured and are still being held hostage. I mean, the United States, I think, does have a stake in this. Um, so do you agree with Oren's assessment here? No, Oren hit it right on, on, on the uh, nail, uh, hit the hammer, hit the nail right on the head. The, the United States hasn't done anything to get its own hostages out of the hands of Hamas. It has essentially defaulted and failed to show up. It doesn't really have any moral capacity here to say, yeah, hey, watch out for our people. There's been no pressure, no meaningful pressure by the United States on Hamas. On the contrary, all the pressure has been placed on Israel, notwithstanding that Israel receives weapons from the United States. Hamas has not been victimized by the United States, has not been attacked by the United States, has not been threatened by the United States. The hostages in, the uh, in Hamas's hands, if indeed they're alive, have never been mentioned. They're not part of this administration's focus at all. Yes, American interests are always implicated, but as Arn pointed out, the United States is a sovereign a country. Uh, it should and must do what is in its national interests when they coincide with those of, of an ally, that's fantastic. When they don't, then the chips have to fall where they may. And so, Matt, um, you know, where does the conflict go from here? Because this um, does appear to be escalating. And now with, you know, Iran potentially entering the picture, I mean, do you think that uh, they're going to be uh, put off by this clear display of power from Israel? Or are we going to see, you know, some of these overtures uh, from Turkey threatening to invade Israel, you know, bringing in even more countries? Um, where where do you think that this goes from here, especially in an election year where now uh, the current sitting president of the United States is clearly the lamest of lame ducks? Sure, a lot to unpack there. Uh, first, Iran has its own internal uh, political strife and upheaval with the uh, the plane crash of the president. I personally believe that was a inside job uh, to replace a potential next supreme leader in the succession with the chosen supreme leader's son. So I thought the fix was in there. Uh, look, the fact that Israel could go to Tehran, just like they can go to Beirut and flex and take out high-ranking heavies in these, uh, you know, malefactors complexes, uh, you know, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of October 7th. I think that Israel will escalate in these formats. Look, there's a catalyst here. You have the, the, the Hezbollah attack in northern Israel four days ago, three, four days ago. Uh, but coming on the one year anniversary of October 7th, I think that they should do all they can to clean this mess up. They've got the military capacity. They've got the moral clarity. And who cares what the Biden-Harris administration thinks, as you pointed out, Biden is lame duck. Uh, the only thing that this administration has done in Gaza is build ineffectual peers to give aid that did not work. They've actually helped Hamas uh, and did everything they could to tie Israel's hands behind its back under the threat of reduced aid or weapon transfers, things like that. When it comes to Turkey, uh, Turkey is just doing what Turkey does. It's a NATO member. It is not going to do anything that would put that at risk. It is internal sable rattling for the Middle Eastern uh, cohort uh, that Erdogan, who is weaker than ever, needs to kind of regalvanize in support of his own strength internally. 
And Oren, what are your thoughts on uh, the escalation and, and the overall conflict? I mean, you know, as, as Matt mentioned, we're coming up on the anniversary of October 7th uh, pretty soon. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that ultimately this is going to be a blood feud that is going to go on for a very long time. The Palestinians are uninterested in being governed uh, by the uh, Israelis. They have no, they want their own state. Whether you think that's a good decision or not, that's ultimately the goal that they have. I don't think Israel wants that. I think they understand that that would put themselves in a great security risk. And so they're going to continue to make sure that they have a heavy hand involved in any organization inside Palestinian territories. This is just a situation where neither side is going to be happy with the other. They all have a very long history of hating each other and having brutal violence done to them. And I don't think any of that is going to change anytime soon. The best thing possible, of course, would be a swift end one way or another to this conflict. But unfortunately, due to the geopolitical ties of so many in the area, we're never probably going to see that. And we're going to keep seeing this game of inches grinding down with an ineffectual game from probably both sides for a long time. So, Ron Coleman, let's talk about uh, the United States in this and the upcoming election. I mean, I thought President Trump made a very strong statement from uh, his nomination acceptance speech at the RNC convention, where he specifically said that the uh, hostages, all the hostages, not just American citizens, need to be returned before he takes office again. And um, that was clearly a, a directive. Uh, but I don't see the Trump campaign actually harnessing a lot of um, the energy around any sort of foreign policy talking points. I mean, even pointing out to uh, the Abrahamic Accords and, you know, some of these things that clearly world stability just honestly was better when Donald Trump was in office. Um, do you think that the Trump campaign needs to step that up? It's an interesting strategic question. It seems to me that they are absolutely letting the Democrats occupy the space right now. It may very well be that, although everyone has his view of what the Republicans ought to be doing, that they want the Democratic infighting and incoherence to be the focus now. It also is possible that there's a little bit of infighting and a certain amount of back and forth on the Republican side, and that they probably don't really have their message together. One thing does seem very clear. It's only July. <laughs> only. Oh, I know. You're reminding me we have so long to go. I'm so ready for all of uh, these these unprecedented times to be over with. But, um, you know, Matt, your take on the GOP's messaging on this. Uh, you know, there's a small cohort within the GOP, or we won't even say the, the Republican Party per se, but the right that is totally Ron Paul on steroids, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, no interventionism whatsoever, let the world burn around us, Monroe Doctrine. Anytime that vacuum that gets created by non-interventionism, power, power pours a vacuum globally, uh, especially in the last hundred years with the Pax Americana, whether you like it or not, that's the reality. Anytime that that accelerates the GOP weakens, it gets less support from independents and moderates who do believe that America is on the margins a force for good. If, you know, there's a debate on expansionism, I think we all agree the adventurism of 2003, four, five, Iraq, Afghanistan was a, a, a sore misstep in American foreign policy. It was too much, too fast, too far. But you don't, don't want the opposite to, to take over the GOP. And so the GOP has been trying to thread the needle, giving credit too much to too many of these extreme non-interventionists that don't have a sense yeah. of balance. Uh, and I think yeah. that they're, you know, well, they we'll, need to be we'll a little have to leave it there, but we'll be back with the political panel to talk about Veep stakes and how that may potentially impact the Democrats' messaging uh, with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. We're back with our power panel for the day, Ron Coleman, Matt Tiermand, and Oren McIntyre. So let's talk about Veep Stakes. Kamala Harris has said that she's going to select her VP on her.
or next Tuesday, and that running mate will be with her at a rally in Pennsylvania. Uh, interestingly, whether or not that signals Governor Josh Shapiro or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but the Daily Wire was actually talking about a poll this morning on Morning Wire that was talking about enthusiasm for both the Democrat and the Republican base. Um, it is, of course, up for the Democrats from 62% only for Joe Biden up to 88% for Kamala Harris, contrasting that with an 82 percent for Republicans. Um, so, Orrin McIntyre, uh, does the Veep stakes actually matter in terms of this uh, bubble bump for Kamala Harris? Seems incredibly unlikely. unlikely. Harris is a horrible candidate. She has never been liked. She has never won a primary. She was polling at like 3 percent when she dropped out originally uh, in 2020. She's just someone who has no energy. And the more she's on stage, the more that people are aware of who she is and how vapid and how terrible she is are only going to sour on her. Right now, she has this incredibly artificial bump entirely manufactured by the media. This is there, There's no grassroots to this. This is all a bunch of white dudes for Kamala Harris type Skype calls that have, you know, a bunch of guys in a struggle session. Who is who is that convincing? And I don't see how any vice presidential pick is going to change that. When you have a candidate that bad, you don't want to put an exciting vice presidential pick behind that person. That's just going to make it how cl clear how unqualified the person who's actually running is. And since Harris is already facing accusations of basically just being a DEI candidate, you certainly don't want to put someone super competent behind her and remind everybody, oh, yeah, she's only here because she checked the right boxes because Joe Biden was an old man who was white and checked out when he ran the first time. Yeah, Ron Coleman, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, there's a reason that the Democrats didn't orchestrate their coup for their replacement candidate until there only is uh, less than 100 days now until the election and early voting starts in less than a month. Um, so Kamala Harris doesn't have to be super convincing for that long of a time period. I mean, she certainly hasn't been running as long as Donald Trump has been uh, in this particular race. But I think there's a reason why the Democrats are trying purposefully to compare her to the enthusiasm and energy of Barack Obama in 2008. Do you think that that's going to be effective? Uh, and can she get a VP that will help that endeavor? Well, as Orange said, it, it's this is all a game. They're, the, the people who are swearing that they've never been more excited in their lives would swear if Joe were still in office also. These are the same people who told us that he was as sharp as a tack. There are very Shots few fired people fired at Harry who, Susan, but sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's simply not, she's not a good candidate. Uh, I, I think that the idea of her bringing in Shapiro is, I mean, I'll, I think I'm, I could be the one to say it. The fact that Shapiro is Jewish will not play well in the Midwest. Uh, it's not what they need to counterbalance J.D. Vance. It, it, it would be a huge mistake for them. Uh, why they're doing it in Philadelphia, if it's not John Shapiro, is beyond me. Uh, I, or pencil, wherever it is in Pennsylvania. But I don't think the VP stakes is going to make a difference. I think J.D. Vance is a great and unregretted. Talk about spin. I assure you, an unregretted choice by Trump. So let's talk about that, Matt, uh, because, you know, so there are suggestions that kind of the top three uh, contenders here are either Gretchen Whitmer, uh, you know, governor of Michigan, Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, or Senator Mark Kelly out of Arizona, all of those, you know, coming um, from states that ultimately matter. Um, so who do you think the pick is going to be? And uh, will there be a debate between that individual and J.D. Vance? Well, don't forget Tim Waltz. The Tim Waltz fan club has been pushing Tim Waltz, the governor of Minnesota, you know, the leftiest state in the country that Mondale won in uh, 84, the only one that he that Reagan lost. Uh, there's, you know, Kamala, everyone, everything that both Orrin and Ron said earlier about Kamala is accurate. Horrible candidate. They've been hoisted on their own DEI petard. They created a debate months before the nomination to force the exit ramp after most of the primaries were over. And now you're stuck with Kamala. I'm actually not convinced Kamala will be the candidate. I think that until the delegates uh, actually vote on the convention, you know, Trump opens up 10 point leads in every swing state. The Dems are ends justify the means win at all costs. And she is a loser who not only could lose that that race, but also a down ballot.
ballot. You've got independent, relatively moderate, uh, appealing to independent type governors, especially two Dems in Republican states with Roy Cooper in North Carolina, Andy Bashir in Kentucky. What Trump did, and I know for a fact from sources uh, inside, that Trump hadn't decided on J.D. Vance until the Monday morning after the shooting, thinking he was on a glide path and said, you know what, I can quadruple down in MAGA instead of, you know, tent expanding, uniting with a, with a more establishment type figure like a Marco Rubio or of which there are a plethora of others. Uh, and I think it's actually not too helpful. I disagree with, I love Ron Coleman. He's one of my favorite people in the world, but I think JD is a horrible candidate, 39 years old, not ready for prime time. He was in fourth place in the Ohio primary until that endorsement came in with two weeks ago and won by a hair. Uh, he does not translate well. He is the Republicans Barack Obama constructed in a lab in Silicon Valley and AEI in DC, who then went back to Ohio and deleted his entire history of uh, condemning MAGA. Uh, he is a construct, and I think most Americans get that. Uh, he's not taken very, very seriously, except if you go to the you know, Edmund Burke Foundation NatCon events, which is a very small segment of the actual voting electorate of the American right. So I don't think he's going to help much at all. Yeah, and honestly, I tend to agree with you, Matt, that uh, you know, if Trump had known for sh for certain that Biden was going to be replaced, I think the Democrats did that purposefully after the VP selection. We probably would have seen a different uh, VP selection, at least you know, I, I would assume so, because Trump is very strategic, and yet uh, he is likely stuck with JD Vance. And um, so, Oren, uh, you know, who do you think that uh, the Harris campaign, if uh, she ultimately is the candidate selection, I don't see how the the Democrats um, can reasonably replace her. I mean, I think they're putting all of their eggs in that basket. Um, but if she is ultimately the nominee, um, who makes the best sense to at least um, it, for the Democrats try to balance out her ticket? I don't see two women frankly, being a very persuasive on that front. Yeah, you do feel like Whitmer probably loses out in that. And you and you do have somebody like Shapiro, as Ron pointed out. Yeah, I don't think that really helps them hedge the best the way that they'd hope to. Anyone who's been paying attention to the direction of the Democratic Party uh, is not going to be suddenly swayed by the idea that they put Shapiro on the ticket and he won't help in the states that they probably really want him to. Ultimately, I don't think that it, again, matters that much who's going to be the vice president for Kamala or for Trump. That's why I think Vance was ultimately a good pick, though. To be fair, I am one of those people who spoke at the Edmund Burke uh, event. Uh, but I do think he's a great pick for the reason that uh, he is insurance. Uh, let's be really frank here. Uh, the left tried to murder Donald Trump. They tried to splatter his brain on television in front of everybody. And a pick like J.D. Vance lets the people who did that know, lets the people who encourage that know, the people who are still wishing for that know that the movement is not just Donald Trump. There is somebody behind him who is just as scary to them. And if they go ahead and try to take another swipe at Trump again, you will simply have a young, spry guy who has the same, if not more terrifying ideas for the left uh, right behind Trump. He is insurance and he's good insurance. He should be there. Well, we'll have to see uh, the results of the assassination attempt task force and whether they actually get to some of those answers of who was really responsible. And I um, mean, you know, it's interesting that the former Secret Service director, that was the only thing that she could absolutely answer was that there was no coordination with anyone else. I find that to be um, a little disconcerting and I don't quite believe it, but uh, we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight to talk more about J.D. Vance and the GOP messaging. Well, you can't watch hardly any media or go on social media without hearing about the crazy cat ladies that J.D. Vance is condemning. Well, let's actually look at what his comments were originally on Tucker Carlson's former Fox News show uh, back when he was running as a candidate for Ohio Senate. This is what he actually said. What he's saying is that we're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable too. And it's just a basic fact. You look at Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. And how does it make any sense that we've turned our country over to people who don't really have a direct stake in it?
So J.D. Vance has since doubled down on this, appearing on Megyn Kelly's show and elsewhere, saying that he didn't mean this overall as a Democrat base, but clearly was saying that the Democrat Party is run by people who aren't invested in the future and don't have a stake in the future of America. But of course, the left is manipulating this uh, like they do everything. And now all of social media is uh, just erupting with so many different responses, including just really bizarre ones like this TikToker. I am childless. I have cats. I am the biggest nightmare of this JD band. I am a lady who loves her pets. They are good for taking care of all the rats. I am woman. This is cat. We are an item and together we are brats. Get out your notebook. We have a quote. <laughs> In November, we are all going to vote. Childless cat lady, I am running the whole country. Childless cat lady, meow, meow. Watch out, JD. Childless cat lady, we are running the whole country. Childless cat lady, you better watch your back, JD. So apparently uh, this is how the Democrats are voting and how they're identifying themselves. I am glad to know that this TikToker understands that she is a woman. So, you know, congrats to her on that. But, uh, you know, could the, the GOP and J.D. Vance be messaging this and this response a little more effectively. Uh, Matt Walsh responded, posting this on his ex account. It would not be hard for Republicans to reframe the quote unquote cat lady attacks on JD Vance as an attack on parents and families. But Republicans are hardly even attempting that reversal. Another huge mistake drives me nuts. I agree with Matt Walsh, but I think that we need to take that even a step further. Uh, while we could frame this as saying, you know, listen, the, the Democrats. Uh, who are in control, don't care about families, they don't care about traditional values, they don't care about incentivizing uh, people with traditional values to have families and children and, of course, uh, live in a society where those things are valued. Why aren't Republicans actually going after women voters like this TikToker, like the people who are very happy that they are childless cat ladies, like the people who are uh, the single women who are very career driven? Instead of insulting them, why aren't we as conservatives going after them and talking about how they're victims of this same structure that the regime of the Democrats has foisted upon them? I mean, why aren't when we're talking about border security, why isn't Donald Trump and J.D. Vance standing up there and saying, if you are a single woman and you're concerned about walking home from work and getting from work to home safely, we want to protect you. We want to make sure that we're closing our borders so that you don't have to be concerned if you are a single woman. And we're not seeing any of that. We're just seeing this doubling down of a condemnation of a choice that a lot of single women, whether you know they're white, black, minority, whatever it is, women in this country who have chosen the single life and the career-driven life that were basically just ceding to the Democrats. Instead of saying, you know, this whole thing about childless cat ladies is insulting to the entire base, actually go after their vote. Start talking about policy, start talking about how the Democrat administration is not actually uh, doing anything that is for you, just like how the the uh, MAGA GOP base is really saying to the black voter, for example, why are you presuming that you're just going to vote Democrat? Look at the policies that have affected you in, in cr uh, criminal ridden societies and cities that are Democrat run. Go after the childless cat lady vote by telling women what the GOP is going to do for you instead of leaning into this sort of chauvinistic, misogynistic uh, rhetoric. I really don't get it. So Team Trump, step up your game. We'll be right back. Let's continue to talk about the messaging from the left and this phenomenon of actually appealing to white dudes and white people uh, for some reason the left is actually uh, seeing us as a voting block and yet it's only because they want us to exercise our so-called privilege. So listen to this clip uh, from a podcast recently. Michael, I want to get your reaction to these uh, affinity groups yes. that have sort of gone, I mean, listen, political affinity groups, this is like 
old yeah. as politics, right? But so first we had a huge organizing call that was like black women for Kamala, then it was black men for Kamala, then we had other minority groups, and then we went all in <laughs> with the uh, affectionately named Karens for Kamala and the white dudes for Kamala. Yeah. Um, let's let's take a look at a little bit of the the content that is being created out of the Karens for Kamala Zoom call. Ariel Fodar, affectionately known as Mrs. Frazzle to her combined audience of over 1.5 million followers, is here to help gentle parent us through this election. I'm going to share some do's and don'ts for getting involved in politics online and navigating the toxicity that comes with it. And spoiler alert, as much as the toxicity can come from the outside, it can come from us too. So first, don't isolate yourself. We can do our best work when we're in community together like we are tonight because the toxic feels smaller when we support each other. But don't make it about yourself. <laughs> As white women, we need to use our privilege to make positive changes. If you find yourself talking over or speaking for BIPOC individuals or God forbid correcting them, just take a beat. And instead, we can put our listening ears on. Like, oh my gosh, you guys, I feel like I'm part of a sorority of like Karens for Kamala. This is so ridiculous. But let's welcome in uh, Ryan Gierdowski, who's the founder of the 1776 uh, Project PAC. And Ryan, you were actually on that panel uh, that was responding to this clip. And my my thought on this whole thing is that finally the left is reaching out to white people and specifically white women, white dudes, only because we are supposed to use our supposed privilege uh, in order to basically repent for what voting Republican all this time? Um, well, I think for part of them was for like the overall responsibility of white people for our supposed sins of being white or what ancestors may or may not have done. It's always the negative of the ancestors, by the way, it's never the positives. I. I, um, it, it was exhausting to listen to her. And, and as I said before, like I would have given everything I possibly had in my bank account for someone to say, ma'am, this is a Wendy's after her conversation, but, uh, after her monologue. But I think that, um, I think that what they're speaking towards is a very specific type of white voters, one that doesn't have to worry about inflation, one that doesn't have to worry about crime because they live in extremely safe, gated, probably almost all white communities um, or in buildings in very nice apartment buildings with, with doormen that are safe. Um, and they don't have um, they don't have the fears of working class people. But if we are now OK and the left has made it the rule that white voters can speak for their own individual needs, then I think that that's a very important thing. There are certain issues that overwhelmingly affect white voters. Uh, there is an epidemic of white male suicide of middle-aged white men. There is an epidemic of, of teenage suicide um, among white teenagers. There is the fentanyl crisis. There is the um, deindustrialization that has been going on for 30 years in overwhelmingly white communities in the Midwest. There is a problem of rural America with a lack of infrastructure. Um, those are serious, serious concerns that are very problematic. The thing is that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden were part of the most racist administration towards white people that we have probably ever seen in our country. Um, for instance, one one instance, the farm bill, the farmers bill that came out years ago um, was I think it was struck down by the Supreme Court. It might have been in a uh, or a minor court. Um, because they were they were saying that 50 percent of all farm aid had to go to black farmers who make up just one percent of all farmers. Um, they have constantly sat there and said that, um, you know, minorities, especially black women, preceded white men when it came to federal appointments and judgeships and um, and uh, other heavy uh, positions. So they could sit there and say it's a part of equity, it's a fight for equity, but what it is is, is an immense racial bias against one specific group, which is white men and white women. Yeah, and, and let's be honest here. I mean, this has nothing to do with actually prioritizing any of those policy recommendations that you just articulated, Ryan. This is all about saying, okay, uh, white men and women, you now are obligated to use your privilege to vote for an administration that hasn't prioritized you. I mean, this is literally the same messaging that Joe Biden said in 2020 to uh, to black voters that if you don't vote Democrat, you ain't black. I mean, they're, they're assuming and presuming that they don't have to earn the vote of this 
base, this constituent base, that it's just a matter of our inherent intrinsic characteristics that obligate us to vote for Democrats, whether or not they're actually looking out for our best interests. And yet, we're seeing that a lot of this um, is actually resonating with uh, with some of these groups that now, you know, the white dudes for Kamala is, is a really big group. Um, we're seeing that there are a lot of a white women group that are saying we're going to apologize basically for our whiteness and you contrast this with some of the what i think has been effective unfortunately messaging from the left uh, that are condemning jd vance for his prior comments about the childless cat ladies and and the republicans don't seem to actually be interested in going after some of these demographics that are being compelled out of at, at a, an apology basically um, to to vote for Republicans over the Democrats. And so, I mean, do you see this as a messaging problem for the Republicans where they're basically just almost conceding this issue and assuming that, you know, white people in general are just going to vote Republican? Well, I think that I, uh, well, there's two parts to that question. One, I think we've seen this playbook by Democrats before, especially towards white women. Um, their efforts to do the grab them by the cat lady is a 2.0 of what they did to Trump, what they did to Brett Kavanaugh, what they did to Mitt Romney back in 2012 with binders full of women. At their core, Democrats will always try to make every Republican look like they do not like women, um, no matter if they are the most moderates in the world or the most right wing in the world. It doesn't matter. They will always sit there and say that they hate women. Um, when you look at policies directed towards women, um, there J.D. Vance has done far more policies geared towards women than Kamala Harris did while he, while she was in the United States Senate, and he has floated things like trying to make um, trying to make hospital fees uh, subsidized when a woman gives birth, so that way he doesn't believe that you know people should be born with thousands of dollars of hospital debt um, right out of the right out of the womb. Uh, that's a very, very pro-family, pro-woman policy that is never, has not been highlighted yet, but I hope it will. As far as arguing and fighting for the white vote specifically, you know, there are, in 2016, there were 42, I think 42 or 44 million white voters, white Americans in this country, rather, who were not even registered to vote, overwhelmingly in the Rust Belt. The Rust Belt is going to be where this election is won or lost. So, uh speaking directly to those voters about the issues that they feel, whether it be both um, economic issues, the rampant inflation under the Kamala Harris uh, uh, vice presidency, or whether it be social issues, feeling isolation, um, you know, which we've had for 25 years in this country, 30 years in this country, uh, written about in Bowling Alone and books like that. But social isolation, um, fear of fear of, uh, of a changing world that really doesn't respect their values, their heroes, who they grew up admiring, looks down on our founding fathers and tells them not only are they problematic for even existing in their own skin, which they were born into, but that they don't have a future. The future is, you know, female, BIPOC, trans, whatever. Um, these are conversations that should be happening. As much as and as important it is to sit there, and I think Republicans have been doing a very good job at this, reaching out to minorities and saying, you know, we want your vote, we want you to sit there and support us. Reaching out to white voters saying, not only do we want your vote, but you are, your issues matter to us in a way that they maybe we haven't done the best job of showing in the past. Yeah, I mean, Republicans hands down win on policy if that is the conversation. But the problem is that so much of this conversation messaged by Republicans is all just about identity, uh, identity politics, whether that's race or gender. And it seems like Republicans are so good at just responding and being on the defensive instead of going on the opposition and forcing it to be about policy. We'll see if Trump and Kamala actually have a debate on that. But thanks so much, Ryan. We'll be right back with more with our political panel right after this. Well, the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 and that conservative cohort for policy and personnel for the presidential transition has ultimately met its demise, uh, even though Heritage Foundation President 
Uh, Kevin Roberts is suggesting that it's already done what it set out to do, regardless of Donald Trump distancing from that. But the Trump campaign put out a statement following uh, the head of Project 2025 is stepping down. And this is what they had to say yesterday. Trump campaign statement on Project 2025's demise. President Trump's campaign has been very clear for over a year that Project 2025 had nothing to do with the campaign, did not speak for the campaign, and should not be associated with the campaign or the president in any way. Reports of Project 2025's demise would be greatly welcomed and should serve as notice to anyone or any group trying to misrepresent their influence with President Trump and his campaign it will not end well for you. That was signed by Susie Wiles and Chris La Civita. And uh, Representative Chris Lonsdale uh, quote tweeted this and said this in response, Trump's top two advisors gleefully cheering for the demise of a good faith attempt by Heritage to try and resolve the personal issues that plagued Trump's first term in office. Heritage and Project 2025 never, never claimed to speak for the campaign and Chris and Susie know that, unreal. Let's bring back our power panel for commentary. Uh, we have Ron Coleman, Matt Tiermand, and Oren McIntyre rejoining us. So, uh, Oren, let's go to you first. Um, you know, I, I find this whole scenario just um, a little bit leaning into the leftist targeted messaging. I mean, Trump could have very easily just said, you know, hey, we have Agenda 47. We're hearing from a lot of different groups, uh, but I'll just point you to my agenda without actually taking a direct swipe at Heritage and the 110 organizations, uh, conservative organizations that genuinely want to help. Yeah, this is a bizarre scenario. You hope that Heritage would have kept things more tightly under their hat, but also the Trump response hasn't been great. I don't know all of the internal details and all of the machinations, but from the outside, it seems like the Trump camp discovered this or had to answer for this and simply got frustrated because it was developed in parallel and they didn't actually have control over the messaging. They didn't want this to become an albatross about, around their neck. And ultimately, I think Trump is the kind of guy who gets offended when someone else is using his name to go ahead and create a project that he didn't necessarily build on. I think ultimately the work of Project 2025 is important. One of the critical failures of the Trump administration's first go around was its inability to properly staff and recognize that personnel is policy. And so the database that they've built, the resource that they have there for the president is something that he should utilize, whether he publicly distances himself from the agenda or not. However, there are plenty of things involved in the Heritage Foundation's creation of Project 2025 that are in the face of what Donald Trump wanted, and they are not the ones driving this thing. I have heard good things about the direction that the Heritage Foundation is going, but ultimately it's not like they aren't a legacy foundation that is based in much of the Washington conservative movement so many people inside the Trump movement are not a fan of. So I wouldn't have taken this tack, but I think you can kind of understand why this generated the animus from the Trump campaign that it did. Well, Matt, uh, let's talk about personnel being policy because you know a lot of the people that were at the helm of Project 2025 were former Trump administration personnel that were with him since 2016. And you have this statement that, you know, frankly, they're trying to kind of sound like the mob bosses, which I found just utterly laughable. But, you know, Chris Lasavita, who's now the campaign manager, I mean, he was out there tweeting at, right after January 6th of 2021, asking for Donald Trump to be tried for treason. And now he finds himself uh, as the campaign manager. I mean, you know, this kind of clash to me, it just suggests that Trump really hasn't learned his lesson and his toxic trait, quite frankly, is to put people who hate him in positions of power while abandoning the conservatives like the Heritage Foundation and others that have a track record of conservative policy and genuinely want to help. As long as they are, are on a front-facing basis, uh, showing just direct adulation to Donald Trump, then you're in his good graces. Uh, you had, you know, Dina Powell, you had uh, Gary Cohn, you had Dems in the administration in the White House last go-around. This whole Project 2025 uh, imbroglio is precisely why we can't have nice things. 110 conservative groups, many hundreds of conservative activists who have been at the absolute tip of the spear fighting for MAGA in all of its forms over the last eight or nine years, thrown under the bus uh, as if to say Heritage is making their money off saying we're going to fill Trump's administration. They are doing very important work. They have for decades. 
Heritage is a 501c3. They're not coordinating with the campaign. They raise $100 million a year. They've been around since like 1978. They've got the largest email and mailing list in the entire American right, conservative, neocon, uh, you know, every form of the right. Heritage is the 800 pound gorilla. So smacking at it does no service to the American right. Uh, yet here we are, Agenda 47 is much smaller. You also have the sinecures at AFPI and all of those uh, uh, sort of brotherly organizations where they will cease to exist when an admin launches because they will yeah. be drained of talent right and back in. So We got to wrap here, Matt, and apologies to Ron Coleman. Uh, we'll get to you next time, but that's all the time we have for Jenna Ellis tonight. Make it a great night.